Tim Geithner's on the phone and he wants to talk to you. So uh, I go over and pick up the phone and he said, I'm on here with uh, Ben Bernanke and, and Hank Paulson. Uh, you know, we want you to sell your firm. And I said, well, you know, out of respect for you, I called Jamie Dimon and he'd only pay me $2 a share. And uh, Geithner said, well, I don't care what he'll pay you. Pick it up and sell your company. And I said, I won't do it. And, and thank God I said, I won't do it. I said, I won't do it. And I hung up on him. My board turned white. <laughs> I, I did, it was the wrong thing to do. And yeah. um, thank God I didn't sell the company. CEO and co-founder. I'm Joe Lonsdale. Welcome to the American Optimist. I'm excited to introduce you to one of my mentors and friends, one of the most extraordinary business leaders in America, John Mack. John has an amazing story. His family came over from Lebanon. He grew up in a small town. He worked his way all the way up to run one of the most important major global financial institutions. He saved Morgan Stanley during the financial crisis. He's somebody who really cares about people. He really inspires others to become great leaders. A lot of people who work for him have become people running things all over Wall Street. And he came out with a great book recently on his life. And I'm excited for you to get to know him. I think you'll admire him as much as I do. Really honored to have Wall Street legend and our friend John Mack, former CEO of Morgan Stanley, here with us today. Thanks, John, for joining. It's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to be with you, especially given our long relationship. Thank you. I'm really enjoying your, 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 your book, Up Close and All In. I think it really shows off who you are as a leader in a lot of ways. And John, why did you choose to, to, to write the book? Why did you write these memoirs? Well, I've had a number of people uh, in the last five or six years saying, look, given what you did and going through the crisis and how Morgan Stanley has become such a great global firm, you need to write a book. So you hear that over and over. And uh, I sat down. Uh, with the woman I worked with, and it just it it just didn't resonate with me the story, and uh, then uh, finally I was introduced to Linda Coleman, and we really hit it off, and I felt comfortable with it, and she asked the right questions, and uh, I've actually enjoyed doing it, but it was people keep saying to me, you got to write a book, and again, the people who sat in our office during the crisis were Geithner. Paulson and Bernanke were trying to get me to sell the firm for $2. And as I said to, I've said before, I, thank God I didn't use some four letter words, but I said, I won't do it. I'll take the firm down first. And I hung up on them. <laughs> People don't do that. Well, I think, I, I think, I think the story, <laughs> That's why I wrote the book. <laughs> and you know, John, I think the story of Morgan Stanley is, is very interesting, but I think the story of you as a leader is even more engaging. Oh, so I'm really you. glad to read it for, for that and to learn more about even who you are. Well, thank you. You told me, I, I'd forgotten, your grandfather came from, was an immigrant from Lebanon. Lebanon, right. right. And he, yeah. went to, he was aiming to join a community in South Carolina, but he ended yeah. up by mistake in North Carolina, exactly, you said? Yeah, he was going to uh, Marion, South Carolina, and uh, he got on the wrong train out of New York and ended up in, um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and didn't know really where he was. So he spent the night there, and the next day the... One of the managers of the train station said, look, there's a family in Charlotte, North Carolina, from Syria, and I'm going to put you on the train to, to Charlotte. And he got there, and they had a coffee shop, and uh, they employed him for a while. And then from there, he was able to make enough money, and he was a peddler. He went well, on a wagon from kind of the rural community around Charlotte in my hometown, Mooresville, North Carolina, selling everything from cloth to shoes to, you know, pins, needles, whatever you needed, he sold. And over time, that morphed into a wholesale grocery business. And you grew up in a rural area then? You, you grew up in the same area? Well, I grew up in the same town, and it was a town of about 8,000 people, but it was a textile town. I would say that over 50% of the jobs were either allocated to Burlington Industries, which is a yeah. textile uh, company, or to uh, one of the newer startup textile companies. So it was, a, it was a middle town. You grew up in this town, you were a top football player, and you got scholarship to Duke? Uh, I don't know if I was a top football player, but I was a pretty good football player. I did get a scholarship to Duke University. And, uh, you know, you really think you're a pretty good athlete, and then you go to college and you see these other young men, and you're just 
one of many, but they were great athletes, and I enjoyed it. I was a pretty good athlete, but I went to Stanford. They didn't want me on their teams for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so that's tough. And you, and you, and you, an injury and ended your football career. What, what, what did football teach you? Did you learn anything from that? Well, I think football teaches you not to give up. I mean, sometimes you're overpowered by someone who's better than you. You try to figure out how do you compete, and I think it really gets your juices going to compete. But unfortunately, I ended up cracking vertebra in my neck. And then every time I would hit someone, I would lose feeling on my right side. Ouch. Yeah, it hurt. So finally, one of the doctors, the orthopedic doctor, said, your career's over. You cannot play football anymore. So I kept my scholarship, which was uh, for a Duke back then. It was a lot of money. And I was able to graduate, uh, I think, a year later. You ended up afterwards going to Smith Barney Atlanta, then going to Wall Street. And, you know, Wall Street, it feels like it was very different when you joined. It wasn't really as much of a meritocracy, was it? No. I, well, I think on the retail sales side, it was a meritocracy. You were kind of an independent operator. And uh, I was going to go to Atlanta to be a broker. And then in one of the interviews, I said, uh, they said to me, why don't you come up to New York and join us in the municipal bond business as a, a trader salesman? So I ended up going to Smith Barney, and I was in the municipal bond business, and then that morphed into a corporate bond business, and uh, I was one of the salesmen and had a pretty good career there. I did well. You talked about how it was a bit of a tough transition for you to go from being the guy on the floor doing the work to being a manager. It, it, was, it wasn't really your, like I said, at first it wasn't your personality not to do it, but then it seems like as a manager, you were, you were really, really close to your people. You were on, you kind of want to be on the floor where right. the action is working with them. Right. I tried to sit on the floor instead of my office. I thought uh, we probably had on the trading floor, you know, 120, 150 people. And you could tell what was going on just by looking at people's faces. You didn't have to hear any dialogue. And the person who was smiling was writing big tickets. And the person who was down and had their head down and walking around drinking coffee was not doing much business. So it was a good way to see what was happening, what was going on. Hearing the stories, it felt like you really liked just like being one of the guys on the floor, like joking around, getting in trouble with them. Like, how, like how, how would you bond with the people you'd work with? Is that, was that on purpose that you're joking with them yeah. to, to get well, to know them? Well, I had a great uh, teacher, mentor, and a guy named Dick Fisher who ended up at, at one point running Morgan Stanley, and I worked for him. And um, I saw the way he treated people. And, and he also gave me a great lesson because uh, I was a pretty tough manager. And I remember he said to me, he said, John, you got the biggest firm, you got the biggest gun in the division. Your goal is never use your gun. Sit down and talk to people and get them to change without intimidating them. So to do that, I moved my office to sit in the middle of the trading floor. And uh, that way you could tell who was doing well, who wasn't doing well. And people would come in my office and chat with me once they got used to having me on the floor all the time. But it really kept me involved in the business and also helped me see who the leaders were and coming up in the organization that should have more responsibility. Tell me a little bit more about trading and market and sales. Like, what, like wh why were you so successful? Why were you able to, to, to grow in the org and become a CEO? You're obviously a great leader who inspires people. Was it a combination of, of being good at the sales and getting people to work for you to perform? Or like, like, like why were you able to climb so quickly? Well, I, I think a lot of it is just I like people, and I can engage and talk to people. I've really never met a stranger. Uh, I remember on one of my trips to the Middle East, uh, the banker was taking me to Saudi Arabia, and we were seeing all the you know important people in Saudi in their robes. And when we finished, we come out, he said, John, I didn't have to give you one prop. You talked solidly with these gentlemen for 30 minutes, and we've had four meetings like that. So I've never had a, any issue engaging and, and talking with people. Some people may say I, I speak too much. But uh, so I was very comfortable with it. And uh, I, I got into the securities business. And then I said, you know, I'd like to be in the institutional business. And, and Smith Barney gave me the opportunity to do that. And I was in the municipal bond business for a while. And then I got approached by others, you know, would you come and join us? And I went to a few other firms. And eventually... I ended up at Morgan Stanley, and uh, I may have mentioned it earlier, when they offered me a job, I turned them down, and it was a private partnership. I would say of the 35 partners, 
20 of them probably went to Princeton, mm -hmm. and the rest of them probably went to Yale or, or Harvard. You're the only Duke guy. I was the only Duke guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I turned the job down. And uh, Dick Fisher said to me, well, you're wrong. You know, come on board. And thank God I listened to Dick. And he was a great mentor and a great coach and got me to dial back being so aggressive and so in your face. Just a little bit nicer. Yeah, yeah, yeah just calmer and one of the things we started doing as I got more and more comfortable in the job, it was clear that on a Friday afternoon at two o'clock, a lot of the men would disappear to go play golf from May to September. And all the, most of the women were still there working. So I decided huh. uh, the women need a chance to play golf, but to play golf, you need to know how to play golf. <laughs> so I reached out to David Ledbetter, who I knew, and we put on golf clinics for our women vice presidents cool. and managing directors. And uh, on one trip, we took them all to North Carolina, where Christian and I have a beach house. And uh, it was just women and, and the pros. And I'll never forget, uh, the women felt empowered that, uh -huh. you know, they were being treated equally. And some of them were actually wonderful athletes. So we started doing things like that, and my whole philosophy was you got to get people to work together and pull together, and you have to hold people accountable, and that's what we did. It seems like you really love to jump in and work with them, too. I like You, you, you cited uh, one of the stories that inspired you was Bill Lee of Duke Power in the oh, book. It's a great story. All right, so Duke Power was a huge client of, uh, of uh, Morgan Stanley. And uh, Bill Lee, uh, they, the main office in Charlotte, I grew up 30 miles from Charlotte, uh, and we would go skiing together with the leadership of uh, uh, Duke Power and, uh, and some of the senior people at Morgan Stanley. And I, I got to know them and see how he treated people. And the thing that really blew me away, we're driving up to the mountains of North Carolina and we're crossing the river there called the Catawba River. And he picks up the old dial phone and he calls the manager of the nuclear plant that's going to go live uh, in the next 24 hours. And he said, this is Bill Lee. I want to speak to the manager. And he got on. And he said, uh, I just want you to know everyone at Duke Power is thinking about you. We know this is going to work. Uh, I can't be more proud of what you're doing. It was just a little phone call. Can you imagine how that manager felt when he hung up? The CEO and chairman of Duke Power calls him up and gives him a pat on the back and a little bit of a pep talk. So from that, I learned more and more about how do you manage and how do you communicate with people. And uh, I tried to observe people like uh, Bill Lee or Dick Fisher. And uh, I tried to pick up the good things from them, and it was very helpful to me. I like the Bill Lee story you gave as well when the linemen were worried about that this new thing they were installing and wouldn't work. So uh, Bill Lee tells a story. He gets a call from a foreman on, on the electrical uh, lines they're putting up. And it says, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, the linemen will not go up the poles. And the reason is they believe the insulation and the wiring is too thin, and they're worried it would arc across and electrocute them. Yeah. So he said, all right, where are you? He said, well, I'm on the Monroe Highway 20 miles outside of Charlotte. He said, all right, I'll be there in an hour. So he jumps in his car, drives out, doesn't say anything to anyone, gets there, gets out of his car, goes over and straps on these clamp-ons, which have little spikes you can go up a telephone yeah. pole on. So he goes right up the telephone pole, reaches out to the wire, and hangs on it. <laughs> Comes back down and says, I would never ask you to do anything I wouldn't do. Everyone jumped and went right up the pole. It was yeah. over with. I love it. So he was a great leader, and I, I just tried to pay attention to, to the good leaders and try to also learn from people you didn't think were very good and make sure you didn't make the same mistakes they did. Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. And I, I also really love some of your stories about traveling all around the world. I guess it was a relatively new thing to go international for these banks exactly. in, the, in the 70s and 80s. And I thought it was really touching when you put your, you, you think you put your aunt on the phone with your, with your mom. Oh, so you yeah, to her. yeah. I'm, I'm in the Middle East and uh, I, I'm uh, in Lebanon now in Beirut. And my mother had grown up there and her sister was living there and hadn't seen each other for... 35 years and you know it, it's kind of the old culture you didn't think about i got a telephone you can call someone yeah so i pick up the phone and 
get an international operator. I connect the two. And it was they were very tearful. It was it was uh, that's neat because they didn't think it was possible to no, talk to each other. But, absolutely, but the cost to come way down right around. That, that. That's right, and it, it it really loosened up and got my mother relaxed. I actually sent her to uh, Beirut a couple of years in a row, and uh, it was a great time. But you know, the old country in many ways. Once you get to America, you stay. You don't move around. Yeah, and I showed them travel today is pretty easy, and we'll get you on a plane and take you over there. That's what we did. That's awesome. Tell me a little bit about doing business in Japan. You talked about this. I, I thought it was fascinating. I, I guess Morgan Stanley was one of the only banks that hired locals Correct. as opposed to bringing it, which seems like an obvious thing in retrospect, but I guess 50 years ago, that's not how the culture worked yeah. in most banks. Huh? Yeah, I, th- I think uh, most banks 50 years ago were very domestic driven and focused. And then finally, Morgan Stanley, um, the way they would do business, they'd actually take a ship, get on a sh- transfer uh, transport ship, or a luxury ship, and they would go from San Francisco to Australia. And the bankers would be there for a month. Markets didn't move very much. Wow. And we ended up, through those relationships, being the bankers for the government of Australia. So the international business was really growing. And uh, I liked Japan. I'd been there a number of times. And uh, we built this wonderful relationship with the Japanese. And... um, I'll, I'll just never forget uh, doing business in Japan. It was very different than doing business in China at the time. And we built this wonderful trust with the Japanese. And we used to bring over one or two of their uh, up and growing partners to work with Morgan Stanley in New York for 12 months. So when we were in trouble and we were looking for money and didn't know if we were gonna make it, we'd get a call from the Japanese. And uh, they, they become real allies over time. Yeah, they did. And, uh, you know, they're the ones that wrote the big check that got us out of the bind. And I remember talking to uh, uh, the leadership of, of, uh, of the Japanese uh, financial service company. And he said, look, I saw the culture when I worked there for, you know, eight months. You had me there as a trainee. And it's a great firm. And we try to take your culture and we're trying to inculcate it into what we're doing that's here a, in Japan. That's a huge compliment. You, yeah. you, you mentioned, because originally doing business in Japan, it sounded like one of the difficulties, which I've noticed as well, is it's hard to get a no. They'll, 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 they'll always say yes. But So how, how'd you get past that to the point where you're able to get more done with them? Is it just building trust? What, what, what is it? It's, it's simple. It's just building trust. I mean, um, when I'd go to Japan... <laughs> I guess you've been to the karaoke bars when you're in Japan. You want to go to karaoke? I'm going, man. Let's go. You want to drink sake? I'm drinking. Let's go. You want to play golf? Let's, let me take you uh, to one of the best golf courses uh, in Asia, and we'd play golf. So we built a relationship. But more importantly, the office was run by Japanese nationals. And we, they would come spend time with us in New York, and then we in, empowered them to run the office. So when people saw me or Dick Fisher or other senior people going to Japan and really being part of the Japanese management team and the way we interacted with them, I think that really gave us a great kind of boost and reputation. These are the people we want to work with and work for. Yeah. And John, you're you're famous for leading Morgan Stanley through the financial crisis in 2008. And you tell some great stories about that. You know, there, there was a moment when Geithner at the time tried to get you, force you to sell the company and you push back pretty right. vehemently. Like, t- tell, us, tell us a little bit about the crisis and about, about that. Well, uh, the crisis uh, had us all scared. We were on the brink. And, and we how, need- what, why, why were you on the brink? How, how did that work? Tell, tell people at the bank. Because you, you, you understand these bank, the bank really well now, having right. run it. Like, why did it get to that point? What happened? Well, uh, a number of the hedge funds uh, would come in and borrow money from us through, through a repo account. And then they would take that money and use it to short our, our stock. And it wasn't just us. They did it to Lehman. They did it to that's us. That's not very nice. No, they're trying to make money. And uh, that's what they did. It's not very nice. But it was, it was also legal. So that's the game. And the other thing is, if you have a fortress balance sheet, they can't take advantage of you. And yep. we didn't, and others did not have a fortress balance sheet. And why not? Sheet. It just wasn't seen as well, you never Well, we never thought we needed it. So why would you sell equity? If you believe you don't need the equity, got it. So you just why, why have the money just sitting there yeah. doing nothing? Yeah. And and you don't you don't think about what's the worst case, yeah. because 
you know, you'd have to go back to 1929 for the worst case. So you basically had to go back so far that you didn't consider Yeah, it. no, no. We're, you know, we've got liquidity. We have customers. You know, we're a public company, et cetera. Knowing what you know now, could you have even done that? Like, if you had done that, would they have said, John, you're crazy. We're not going to waste all this money sitting here? Or, like, like could, 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 like, could it have even been done? Uh you wouldn't have done it because your return on equity would have been so Yeah, it would have lowered your return on equity. Yeah, People would have thought you were crazy. That. Exactly. Yeah. They would look yeah. at you and say, what? Yeah, why, are you, why are you hurting our numbers it, that it, way? Exactly. Interesting. But with the advent of hedge funds and short selling, you could do a run on the bank. Yeah. And what would happen, people would lose confidence, sell your stock. And it just, it's like a, you know, a ball of snow rolling downhill. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more stock was being sold. So we were in a, in a crisis mode, and uh, Tim Geithner, who ran the New York Fed, called me and said, look, um, I, I can't have Morgan Stanley go out of business. I want you to call Jamie Dimon, and he will buy your company. Now, we're desperate. I called, I called Jamie, and he said, John, I don't want your company. <laughs> he said, I said, well, Tim, uh, Tim Geithner says you do. He said, John, if I were to buy your company, I wouldn't pay you $2 a share. That's not fair. Yeah. And I said, well... I'm not going to sell for two dollars a share. So, uh, so Geithner calls me back and said, uh, did, "Did you talk to Jamie?" I said, "Yeah." Now, we're waiting for the Japanese to come in, so we're yeah. time the hours are just flipping. About another four hours they'll be in. Joe, we have nothing to do. We're waiting for the Japanese. So we're all sitting there watching the St. Louis Cardinal play the New York Giants. We're watching the football game. <laughs> so we're in my office, watch TV with my board. And my assistant comes in and says, uh, Tim Geithner's on the phone and he wants to talk to you. So uh, I go over and pick up the phone and he said, I'm on here with uh, Ben Bernanke and, and Hank Paulson. Uh, you know, we want you to sell your firm. And I said, well, you know, out of respect for you, I called Jamie Dimon, and he'd only pay me $2 a share. And uh, Geithner said, well, I don't care what he'll pay you. Pick it up and sell your company. And I said, I won't do it. And, and thank God I said, I won't do it. I said, I won't do it. And I hung up on him. My board turned white. <laughs> I, I, it was the wrong thing to do. And yeah. um, thank God I didn't sell the company. The Japanese did come in. They've been great partners. The firm is flourishing. And, it, and, it's, and I think it's really important for America, I, I think, to have these separate institutions that are very strong. Morgan Stanley okay. spends, I think, five, six billion dollars on technology yeah. per year, which has been huge for a lot of our companies. None of that Good. would have happened in a separate way if you know yeah. if, if it, you'd sold it. Well, you know, look, it's it's turned into a technology driven business and, and we use it everywhere. And what James Gorman has done is really elevated the use of technology across the entire firm. So it's critical. Plus, you know, uh, I'm sure our bankers have called on you in the past. Oh, yeah. We're in that business. So we, we love it, love it and love okay. our clients. And uh, you guys are right in the middle of the business doing the big deals. When the techs come out with Elon Musk, it's, it's the people on your hands of guys. It's the guys on your side, you know, doing, yeah. doing the deals still. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. know, it, it, you got to get a lot of credit uh, to Mary Meeker because when she was the analyst way back then, she really pushed the firm to get a lot more involved in tech, and we did. Thank God. I'm curious what you think about something Mary said since you mentioned her. She's someone I really admire. Uh, one thing, there's, there was a lot of noise around how women are treated in technology and the technology world. And one thing she said that I thought was interesting was that uh, it was actually even much tougher for women, you know, 30 years ago on the street compared to anything that they face in the technology world today. And and and. and is, is, was that was that the case in your experience? Obviously, you talked told stories of reaching out and working with women right. and, how, and helping them. But but was that the case overall back back thirty forty years ago? Was it was it tougher? Yeah, it was. There were very few women on Wall Street, and I think there was a view about you know they want to raise a family, they're really not dedicated. And then you had superstars like a Mary Meeker, like a Zoe Cruz, who yep. ended up being president of the firm, and all they needed is a chance to show their their uh, talent. And I think the flexibility uh, of the firm, given them the break they needed, uh, whether it was to take care of a child or have a child, I mean, we were, well, we want talent. And if you only focus on men, you've lost 50% of the talent base. Yep. And the women are just superstars. I mean, Zoe Cruz is an outstanding trader and manager, did a great job. Mary Meeker did the same thing. So it just seemed natural you know, 
to, to see these women in, in roles that uh, show real leadership. My wife, Christy, who's really focused on health care from scratch, has started a whole initiative on health care. And, and her father was a physician, and he, she saw how he treated patients. And she has a real focus on medicine and how clinics should be much more engaged with the patient versus take two pills and call me tomorrow. Tell us a little bit about your philanthropy and how, what you guys focus on. You, do, you care a lot about refugees. You care a lot about health care. It seems like your, your biggest area. Yes. So how, how, are you getting, how are you getting the clinics to focus on the patient differently? What are you doing in this area? Well, one way to get them to focus is give them funds. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it works uh, when you're willing to support and uh, put money up. And in Christy's case, she built an integrative health clinic at Duke University, and she funded the entire thing. Wow. And then the trainees or the young doctors who are internists up at Duke Medical School get to pass through and see a more hands-on, more touch than just take a pill and call me tomorrow. So our focus has always been there. And you guys also support some great hospitals. Like- uh, we have. Uh, I'll never forget uh, Bob Baldwin, who was our chairman, he used to be Undersecretary of the Navy, it got me to come up to, to the hospital. And I said, I, I don't want to go to the hospital, Bob. I've been on hospital boards. All you want's money. I'll give you money. He said, no, I want you to come up there. So being who he was, we went up there, and uh, they took us up to the neonatal care. And Christy and I saw these premature babies all on life support in an old, antiquated, if you were a parent again, it, you would have been frightened. So I came back and said, I got uh, about 12 of our young partners who had families, and I said, come up. I want you to see how medicine is being uh, practiced. And they all were shocked. Even though it was ethical, it was great medicine, it was old and it needed to be yeah. upgraded and you didn't need to scare parents the way they were being frightened. Yeah. So I said, look, if we raise $3 million, we can upgrade this whole thing. So it's been a couple of weeks, we raised $3 million That's and great. we went up and saw what we had changed and done. So then Christy and I said, you know, what we really need is a children's hospital. And Christy and I are going to give $20 million wow. to start a children's hospital. And I want Morgan Stanley to get involved. So That's the employees raise the money. Morgan Stanley put some money in it. And then when our clients heard about it, when you walk into the main entrance of the children's hospital, it's called the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital, you see etched on the wall clients who gave money and the people at Morgan Stanley who gave money. And what's happened, Joe, is uh, on a weekend, a lot of these employees at Morgan Stanley will go up to the children's hospital and read stories That's awesome. to these kids in bed. So it was a win-win across the board. And I think, I think Christy and I are so pleased of what we've done in North Carolina in integrative health and what we've done up here at, at uh, Presbyterian Hospital, New York Presbyterian. And you guys have done amazing work. And it's really cool seeing Morgan Stanley itself has that philanthropic culture. When I've gotten involved in causes that I'm passionate about when right. we work with the bank, they've actually jumped in and supported some of them, like the Ashton Kutcher thing with Thorne where we were helping right. save kids. So it's, it's, it's really cool how you created that culture there. Well, I, I think it's important... Look, do you want to work hard and make money? Yes. Do you want to take care of your clients and make them look good and help their stock go up? The answer is yes. But you have an obligation, I think, to the societal needs. It's not just paying taxes. You can do more than that. I mean, we've all been blessed on the money we've made. We've got to do more with it to help people. Agreed. So season three for American Optimist, it's our build season. We're talking about building and leading successful organizations. So I want to ask you a little, a little, a little bit about that. Again, diving in, well, on your leadership and management philosophy, I remember one of the nicknames you had was Mac the Knife. Right. Tell, tell me about that. Well, it, I guess there's a song out that Bobby Darren sang, Mac the Knife. Uh, <laughs> when we had to cut heads, I cut heads. I mean, uh, I also anticipated if we'd gotten too, too large, a little, a little flat and a little flabby, uh, I would do layoffs. And I didn't enjoy doing it. But you owe it to the organization to keep it at maximum pitch. And how about the person who is, you know, killing himself or the lady who's killing herself, working hard, and you have some people who are just not up for the performance we need. And I think it's unfair to the organization and unfair to that individual. So my view was you, you, you give them an evaluation. We evaluated people every year. 
and said, look, you got to improve in these areas. And if they didn't improve, then they were on probation. And if they didn't improve from there, they had to leave. So yeah. I think that's how they call me Mac the no, Knife. I mean, the, the, well, it makes sense. We've seen a lot of that this year in the tech world. Yeah. You know, one of the contrasts for your leadership style was, I think, Phil Purcell was more right. top down. You were more bottom up. What, what does that mean? Well, I just believe that, uh, you know, if bottom up, you really understand the organization and what they need. And that doesn't preclude you from making, you know, the, the big mic, uh, macro decision from the top. I just don't believe to run a, a people's business. And you call it investment banking, you call it finance, you call it sales and trading. It's a people's business. Computers do some of it, but basically people are making decisions. You got to know the people. You need to walk around and look at someone and see, you know, you can tell when people are stressed and go over and talk to people. You're good at reading people. You got to see. Well, what yeah. I hope I am. I, I, I'm sure I've made a number of mistakes, but uh, you said it sounds like with clients, even you'd sit and you'd read, you'd read them, and that's that's part. Of it. it sounds like it's one you of your talents. To, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think I told you this earlier. There was one client who's so abusive to my assistant. Uh, I reached over and grabbed his tie and pulled him across. Said, "Talk to me like you talk to her." Never happened I love again. It. Yeah, Kim. <laughs> That's, that's, so, uh, that's a way to stand up for your people. I love well, it. Well, you have to. You have to. Yeah. And uh, whether it's your superstar trader salesman or your, your assistant, you got to help them. Look, uh, Purcell was a good guy. He just wasn't uh, walking around and doing the things that I thought were important. And in, in one of my trips to the West Coast, I went out to see Safeway stores. And uh, I got there really early, had nothing to do. So I said, take me to the local uh, Morgan Stanley Dean Witter office. So I go in and all the salesmen, you know, they've probably never seen someone as senior as me in management in there. They're just bombarding me with this complaint, that complaint. That's on great. And on. Yeah, no, I, I was taking it all in. So when I, when I get back, I talk to the, uh, the manager who runs the whole system. I said, look, this is what they're saying. And so I'm talking to uh, Purcell and he says to me, you know, you, you shouldn't do that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, Ed Brennan, who ran Sears, uh, would never go to a Sears store without, you know, telling the manager he was coming. Huh. And I, I said, Phil, this isn't f***ing Sears. It's Morgan <laughs> Stanley. We don't do business that way. So we just had a different view of how to manage. And uh, good guy, smart guy. Thank God we did the merger. Um, but... I believe you get involved. You let yeah. managers manage, but you need to be involved with them, and you need to be seen and engaged with the people who work for you. And, and what was it about your culture that you think reflected well for Japan? You said, obviously, Mitsubishi, the guy had been a trainee. He really right. respected Morgan Stanley as part of why they right. kind of saved you in 2008. Like, what about the culture were they noticing? Well, I think it was, the, we were, back then, we were a small private uh, a partnership. So it wasn't a huge firm of 1,000 people. It was probably four or 500 people. What he observed was the camaraderie and the teamwork of how bankers and traders work together to do deals or to give advice to clients. And that really stuck with him. And his goal was when he went back, he told me afterwards, he wanted to take that culture and inculcate it into the Japanese structure. So that's what he remembered, and he said the this camaraderie firm, and working together. Exactly, yeah. kind of internal trust of people. Age. How, how was that different? Do you think than some of the Japanese culture at the time? I think it's very hierarchical. I mean, Got it's it. uh, much more about someone telling someone yeah, else what to do. Right. Versus, exactly, that makes sense. And you know, it, up until the last twenty-five years or so, uh, maybe thirty years, uh, management here in, in the financial service business have basically stayed off the trading floor and stayed in their offices. That's but not, that, that's not who you are. At no, all. You want to know yeah. what's going on yeah. and you want to know, uh, what's going on and what's not going on and sitting out on a trading floor where you could have 150, 200 people. It gives you a sense of everything. Going you, on. you can tell in a minute what's going on. So, and, and to me, Given the job I had running the division, that's what I should do. I should be on the floor, not in my office. Were the, were the, maybe this is an inappropriate question, but were the trading floors more fun 30 years ago? Were, Absolutely. Were there, it, f it feels like the energy would be higher. You could say incorrect things. Absolutely. You go back 35 years ago, you walk on a trading floor, you'd see a Frisbee going across the trading floor. Someone would flip it <laughs> and go over there. You'd see a, a delivery guy come in with, you know, 20 boxes of pizza and people kind of socialize. And, and for a period from about 1130 to 130, no one did any business. 
Yeah. It was much more relaxed and easy, but uh, you, you didn't have the volume and the turnover in the markets like you have had in the last 20 years. So it's had to become more professionalized. Big time. And people trade and make decisions 24 to 12. It's just constant. Is there any way we can have more fun today like they used to? It seems, it seems like it was more fun then. It was more fun. I don't think so. I think you have to take the fun and say, this afternoon we're going to have a softball game. Sure. Or we're going to do a 10K but, race. But you can't be screwing around quite as much. Not as much. Not at all. No. Um, I would, I'd like to try it, though. I think I could pull some things off. I bet, I, bet, I, bet, I bet you could. <laughs> John, we started the American Optimist to push back on a lot of the pessimism and cynicism we're seeing from a lot of people in our country, especially from some of our, our young people. What would you say to people about the future of America? What, what's a good reason to be optimistic? Well, number one, it's a democracy. Number two, I think the American people, at the end of the day, are smart. And even though you have cyclical changes in political leadership, we, we get our balance and we come back and get into the middle of the road if that's where we need to be. Or in some cases, we, we get to the sense that we need to be a lot more disciplined and a lot more uh, direct with our allies. And, I, and I, think it, I think it's a pendulum that moves back and forth. But when you look at this country, um, I couldn't be more optimistic. Just think at our education level, how it's changed and how, you know, a lot of things you've done, how computers have made these young men and women starting, you know, my granddaughter, when she was four years old, had a computer playing around with it. And now at age 14, it's like part of her body. She can do anything. And I think they're much more educated in, in the sense of what's going on globally. Mm -hmm. And it's not as focused on what's in New York State or in just the United States. So technology, I think, has really opened the door for, for global kind of coming together. So I'm, I'm really bullish on where we're going to go. And, and, and how, how do we inspire the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs? There are a lot of cynical kids, oh, the world's so broken and climate change is going to destroy everything and, and we're just, you know, everything's bad. Like, like, what, like what, how, do we, how do we respond to that energy? Well, you, you, you think about, uh, in one way, everything's bad. Look what's going on in Ukraine and Russia now. Who would have thought that freedom was that important? The Ukrainians would suffer what they've suffered, but yet fight back. I think there's a sense of uh, we want a better life, and I think technology's had a great deal to do with it. I think uh, young men and women see that. They see they can communicate around the world just off a laptop, and they see a you know, I don't know if it's a third world country, I don't think it is, but a, a smaller country taking on the Russian bear and how people are responding to it. I think that's inspiring. There's, there's people who are willing to fight for, for yeah, our principles. Absolutely. And, and the real issue to, to me, if you said, what, what is your fear in a geopolitical sense? Given what Russia has done in the Ukraine, and if you go to China, which I know you've been, you ask any Chinese leader, Taiwan is part of China. So, What's going? To, how's, how's that going to play out? I've never met, uh, and I've met a lot of Chinese citizens and, and leaders. Every one of them says the same thing. How is that going to play out? And uh, that is my worry. So that's, that's, that's your biggest concern yeah. is what happens with China and Taiwan. And what's your, what's your thing you're most excited about for the next 10 or 20 years? What's, what's going what's gonna to get better the next decade or two? What's going to get better? Well, I don't know. I think health care is getting better and better. And I think health care is gotten away from, you know, take these pills and come back next week and we'll check your, your temperature. I think what's getting better, people are taking better care of themselves. I think medicine has made huge strides. And I think people understand it's great to work, you know, 40 hours a week, but at some point you got to take a deep breath and spend time with your family and your friends. And I think, I think millennials have really brought a lot of that out, and I think it's terrific. So that's the change, and I think it's a very positive change. Awesome. Well, John, that's a great note to end it on. I really appreciate it. Thank well, you. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. You're a good friend. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.